going. Uh, we're about to start now. Everyone has the right time zone. Everyone's in the right place. And uh, this is gonna be a, a two hour seminar on uh, baseball and softball on, on pitching. And um, I wanna first uh, thank ISBS for uh, inviting me and allowing us to put this together uh, with the American Baseball Biomechanics Society. And I certainly wanna thank the sponsors, uh, Vicon, the uh, sponsor of ISBS with, with Simi, the uh, sponsor of this symposium. So we're gonna talk now about, uh, let me just uh, move this thing on my screen here. We're gonna talk about the uh, biomechanics of baseball and softball pitching. And uh, let's see, click here. As I said, this is a really uh, a collaboration between uh, ISBS and ABBS. And everyone who's here should know what ISBS is. It's been around for 40 years and it's uh, the host of the symposium. But you might not know about the American Baseball Biomechanics Society. We just established it last year in 2020, and it has a mission to provide valid, valuable biomechanical information to baseball players, coaches, teams, and organizations, and to set standards for sports biomechanics evaluations and analyses within a baseball setting. And really, what came about is uh, as we are all into sports biomechanics, but in particular, baseball has really embraced biomechanics and is hungry for biomechanics, which is good for all of us. And uh, so we formed this society this past year. You could check out the website later if you want, baseballbiomechanics.org. I wanna say our, our society, the baseball, the ABBS has 13 corporate sponsors. You see some familiar names. If you're in sports biomechanics, you should recognize a lot of these names. In addition, some of them are, are baseball specific sponsors. And then, uh, of course, we have uh, Vicon as part of ABBS, as is SEMI, and as is DARI, which is the title sponsor for our society. Uh, in addition to corporate sponsors, we have already 185 members of the ABBS. And of this 185 members, we have four of them here today, myself, uh, Dr. Gretchen Oliver, Dr. Saki Oyama, and Dr. Arnel Aguinaldo. And we're going to um, talk about baseball and softball pitching. Now, instead of talking for 30 minutes each, uh, Gretchen, Saki, and Arnell, and having a 30 minute question and answer, I decided we'll divide into two one hour sessions instead of a two hour, instead of one two hour session. So the first hour, we're gonna concentrate on the kinetic chain in pitching. And uh, Gretchen's gonna start with the biomechanical comparison of softball and baseball pitching. And then Saki is going to talk about the trunk kinematics and upper extremity joint loading in baseball pitching. Arnell's then going to talk about estimating segmental energy flow in baseball pitching. And then we'll have uh, questions and answers for all three of them. So while Gretchen and Saki and Arnell are presenting, feel free, if you want, to hit the chat button and submit some questions. And then we'll get to them, uh, hopefully, during the question and answer period. So that's the first hour. We're gonna talk about the kinetic chain in pitching. In the second hour, we'll have the same faculty and we're gonna talk about the biomechanics of baseball pitchers with and without weighted ball training. Cause the second hour is about does training affect pitching mechanics. So Arnell will talk about the weighted balls. Then Saki will talk about the effects of training proximal segments on the baseball pitching biomechanics. And then Gretchen will take us to the hip range of motion and strengthening in softball pitching. And then we'll uh, conclude with questions and answers again. So that is my introduction. And now I'll turn it over for our first presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, Gretchen, you can, you're up, yes. right? Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'd like to again thank ISBS for this opportunity. So this morning, I want to shed some light on a biomechanical comparison of baseball and softball pitching, uh, because I think many times we look at the two and automatically think of all the differences. But I want us to kind of take a step back and think of it a little, a little bit differently. Now, when I think about baseball and softball pitching, I'm looking at uh, 
The things that I see different are just a few of the observables, like the field. One has a mound, the other one doesn't. Uh, softball's throwing at 43 feet and baseball's at 60 feet. But um, I think that if we, I, I do wanna show you these two uh, videos here real quick to familiarize because some people may not be as familiar with the softball pitch. So um, with the softball pitch and the baseball pitch, I'm gonna break them down and to where hopefully we can say, okay, there, there are a lot of similarities in these. So when you're looking at this, um, like I said, the observable difference, one's throwing from a mound, the other one's throwing from flat ground and uh, softball's underarm, baseball's overarm, baseball has a smaller ball, softball has a larger ball. However, when we look at the mechanics and we look at the throw, we're seeing that each one of them have very similar aspects where we have a wind up, which is a preparatory phase prior to foot contact. Uh, we also have an acceleration phase. And in baseball, after foot contact, you've got um, your acceleration phase, getting into maximum external rotation to ball release. So, um, or excuse me, the caulking phase from foot contact to maximum external rotation. Well, in softball, if you look down here, it's really um, the caulking is when the arm's just about at 90 and then up to the top of backswing. So the top of the pitch in softball to me is very similar to that maximal external rotation point in baseball. So when we're looking at, when we read the literature and we think of, um, okay, what are the major events within the baseball pitch? What are the events that we are examining? Maximal external rotation of the shoulder in baseball, the same thing goes for softball. That's would be considered right here, the, the top of the pitch when the arms uh, directly above, or as we'll say, we often refer to it on a clock as 12 o'clock. Then from 12 o'clock to ball release, that would be acceleration for softball, just as in baseball from maximal external rotation to ball release is uh, gonna be your acceleration phase. So, but to take a step back, when I think about throwing, I wanna think about that, um, let's look at it as both baseball and softball pitching as a dynamic upper extremity movement. And if we think about it as a dynamic upper extremity movement, then we have to go back to the theoretical uh, upper extremity movement, such as throwing or, or striking, that we are an open link system of segments. And so we are gonna work in a proximal or distal manner. And our end goal, of course, is accuracy and uh, speed, right? They, we want them to throw it as hard as possible and to hit that spot within the strike zone if it's hit the corner, wherever it is. So we are very dependent then upon our, our proximal segmental histories, which um, that when I say proximal to distal in throwing, we're starting from proximal would be the lower extremity as we move distally to the upper extremity and on out to the ball. So um, my point is, I, I feel that we need to have a change of rhetoric here because if we're saying throwing, throwing is throwing is throwing in my book. And think about it, in baseball, we have several different arm slots. So if you look at the baseball picture, you can see that, huh, the baseball picture, uh, as compared to softball, softball really does somewhat flow into one of those arm slots. And the whole theory is for both types of pitches, we're trying to get um, maximum efficiency of our body acting as a kinetic chain. So we're trying to produce the most we can from our proximal segments and then transfer that energy on into our more distal segments. So that's when everybody says, well, softball pitching is a more natural movement because it looks that way on first glance, right? Well, I guess on first glance, if you really look at competitive softball, you may not think it's a natural movement, but if you just isolate to one's overhand, one's underhand, then you're like, oh yeah, an underhand pitch, that's gonna be a much more natural movement. 
And so it should be easier on the body. If it's easier on the body. Oh, well, that's why they don't have uh, pitch count restrictions because they can uh, throw as, as much as they want to. Well, actually we have, um, we debunked this way back in 98 and 2006, but that really hasn't taken off in that people still don't get the fact that, okay, the joint loads about the shoulder in softball pitching are very similar to the joint loads about the shoulder and elbow during baseball pitching. Now it's a different timing aspect. So um, the joint loads that we see in softball are gonna be more in that acceleration phase and some of the joint loads in baseball may be more in the deceleration phase. However, at the end of the day, the movement that we're creating this dynamic upper extremity movement, be it baseball pitching or softball pitching, they are both producing approximately the same loads per body weight on their joints about the upper extremity. So if we're going to say, okay, in theory, these two should be similar, then I think we need to approach softball like we approach baseball. In baseball, we have this huge, um, we, we worry about all the injuries. So when looking at injury rates between softball and baseball, it's been found, um, Shanley examined, they examined high school baseball and softball. And overall, the softball players had more injuries than the baseball players. Now, uh, when you look at total exposures, time on field, these rates are low in comparison to some of the other sports, but they were, were having significant injuries. Then if you look specifically at a more recent study of baseball um, and softball, we see that there's greater injuries in the elbow and baseball, and we'll say that there's greater injuries in the shoulder and softball. So when I'm um, looking at rehabilitation or looking at mechanics, we're gonna focus probably more in softball about the shoulder and in baseball more about the elbow. Again, both of these epidemiological studies, we found that uh, based on exposure time, the overall injury rates were low. Now, um, with these injuries, I will say that uh, there's another couple studies that were looking at injuries. And um, this is where they looked at injury predictors. And this will go into some of my next talk, but looking at range of motion, just looking at shoulder range of motion, uh, glenohumeral internal external um, rotation, they looked at preseason and they followed them. And those in preseason, both softball and baseball that had a decrease of a shoulder internal rotation of um, if they lost more than 25 degrees. So if they had a greater a de deficiency between their throwing side and their non-throwing side, that they were four to five times more likely to sustain an upper extremity injury. Okay, we, we see a lot with GERD, glenohumeral uh, ro rotational, uh, deficiency. We see that, but most of the literature is focused on baseball. Okay, but uh, in this study in 2011, like, you know what, we don't talk a lot about GERD in softball pitching. However, those pitchers, softball pitchers who, and position players, all of them who had a decrease from their throwing side to their non throwing side or greater than 25 degrees did um, were more susceptible for injuries. I would say. So we, we do have a difference with the injuries. Baseball is gonna be more about the elbow, softball is gonna be more about the shoulder. Both baseball and softball seem to sustain injuries more in a game versus in practice. The interesting thing is uh, softball pitchers tend to sustain their injuries early in the season, while baseball pitchers tend to um, sustain their injuries later in the season. So we know that um, we have a high susceptibility for injuries and we're starting to see that more in softball as well. And so um, we also know that there's a lot of studies uh, connecting pain to injuries. And so with looking at that, that's where, okay, we really can now start to compare the, the softball literature to the baseball literature in examining pain because we put out a few studies we're looking at those with upper extremity pain and seeing, let's look at their kinematics and seeing what's going on. So um, in a 2015, 
study, Keeley looked at variables associated with pain in baseball pitchers. And it was pelvis and trunk kinematics and stride length. So there were alterations in either position or timing of the pelvis and the trunk, as well as their stride length. Okay. Then uh, a couple of years ago, we looked at collegiate pitchers in the Keeley study, those were youth collegiate pitchers and those with upper extremity pain versus um, those without upper extremity pain. And again, we found differences in their trunk kinematics. That's where the alterations were, their stride length. And we also looked at their center of mass, um, where their center of mass was at foot contact, if it was moving forward, because softball pitchers tend to old school would be moving more backwards at ball release and we want them moving forward to throw the heart. So right here, we're seeing, huh, we know we've got injuries in both. And looky here, when we look at pain associated with kinematics, it's the same kinematics that are altered with um, both softball and baseball pitching. So the biggest thing that we're finding is stride length, trunk kinematics, our posture, and our timing of foot contact. That is across the board. If you go back and pull the baseball literature, those are the kinematics, pelvis and trunk, pelvis and trunk, stride length, and um, their timing's off. So here, this goes back into the theory where I say throwing is throwing is throwing. We really should look at it as, okay, this is a full body dynamic movement and we need to coordinate our segments from proximal to distal in order to have the most efficient outcome. So in summary, I do think we need a change in rhetoric. Um, I've had many, many, many uh, clinicians come to me and say, go, oh, I don't know what to do with the rehab of a softball pitcher. And I was like, it's the same thing. We should be working on the same thing because if you look into the literature, the kinematic problems we're finding are the exact same from baseball to softball. So um, we have to take a step back and think of throwing in general. And when we're working with these, unless we are the pitching coach, then many of the aspects that we are applying should be very similar. Fatigue is associated with pain. We see that in baseball and softball. That's a whole nother lecture. Um, if they have pain, many of the studies did just look at pain and not injury, but we do have evidence that pain is associated with injury and altered kinematics. So all in all, I do think we need to take a step back and look at it a little differently and start applying some of the studies and mimic the baseball studies so that we can really say that all in all, minus the release, they're pretty much similar. Thank you. Thanks, Gretchen. Uh, Saki will go next. Uh, and, and if anyone has questions for Gretchen, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll get to all the questions later. And uh, Saki is gonna speak now. All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Fleissig, for organizing this event and also allowing me to participate in this. Um, I'm very uh, excited to uh, be a part of this. Uh, my name is Saki Oyama, and uh, I'm an associate professor at University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, in my first presentation today, um, I'll talk about the trunk kinematics and upper extremity um, joint loading in baseball pitching. Okay. So as we all know, uh, trunk is the proximal base for the throwing arm. And we know that the throwing arm motion is affected by the way pitchers move their trunks. In a classic paper by Feltner, uh, he talks about how the trunk motion relates to uh, the throwing arm motion. Um, as the pitcher rotates their trunk towards the hitter, the shoulder accelerates forward and causes the arm to lag. And in response, the muscles produce the horizontal adduction torque to accelerate the arm and trunk forward. The forward acceleration of the elbow in turn causes the forearm and hand to lag behind, causing arm cocking and elbow valgus. And Feltner also described how the rotation of the torso causes the centripetal acceleration of the arm to cause elbow extension. Uh, the EMG study shows that the triceps muscle is in fact uh, very, uh, not very active um, during the rapid elbow extension that occurs during pitching. So these descriptions of how the arm motion is influenced by the acceleration produced by the trunk motion illustrates how the trunk motion directly affects the throwing arm motion. <clears throat> 
So uh, we conducted a study uh, looking at the relationship between the drive leg ground reaction force and ball velocity in high school pitchers. Uh, we found that the ball speed was correlated with the peak resultant force and the vertical and resultant force at the time of peak anterior force. Uh, but we also found that the relationship was not very strong. Uh, the variables only explain 10 to 20% of the variance in ball speed, uh, which suggests that the high school pitchers in the study were not very effective in using the uh, push-up force generated by the drive, drive leg uh, to increase their arm velocity. This suggests that the momentum that was generated by the drive leg was lost in the pelvis and trunk, uh, which links the upper and the lower extremities. Uh, the pitchers who cannot effectively use the momentum generated by the legs may rely more heavily on the arms to produce ball velocity. Um, in a study by Luella and colleagues uh, that compared the pitching kinematics uh, between the professional and high school pitchers, they reported that the elbow valgus stress was not correlated with ball velocity in professional pitchers, uh, but was strongly uh, correlated with ball speed in high school pitchers. Um, this means that the professional pitchers who throw hard do not necessarily place higher stress on their elbows. Um, however, high school pitchers who are not as skilled um, in using the momentum from the legs are throwing hard by placing more stress at the elbow. So in addition to the trunk motion directly affecting the arm movement, um, as I described in the previous slides, uh, inefficient trunk mechanics may increase the stress put on the joints uh, through compensatory arm motions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, during the windup and the stride, the pitcher's trunk is vertical or slightly flexed, uh, facing perpendicular to the direction of the throat. Uh, then the pelvis starts to rotate forward before the stride foot contact, and the trunk starts to rotate on the pelvis after the stride foot contact. And during the arm cocking and oscillation phases, the upper torso extends as the pitcher pushes the chest forward. And at the same time, the trunk segment continues to move into forward flexion, uh, lateral flexion away from the throwing arm and axial rotation to face the hitter. Um, and having described the normal trunk motion uh, during the pitching, um, I'll talk about several trunk kinematic variables uh, that's been linked to higher joint kinetics. In 2013, uh, we published a paper uh, demonstrating that the excessive contralateral trunk tilt was associated with higher ball speed, but also with higher joint loadings uh, compared to the pitchers um, whose head did not deviate as much to the side. Uh, the excessive contralateral tilt in this study was operationally defined as the trunk tilt that positions the pitcher's head more than one head width uh, away from the stride foot. Uh, stride foot. Uh, the pitchers with the excessive contralateral tilt pitch with higher ball velocity, uh, but experienced 11% uh, higher shoulder exhortation torque, um, elbow valgus torque, and peak shoulder distraction force compared to the pitchers uh, without the excessive tilt. Uh, we concluded that this technique, um, often described as pitchers falling off the mound, um, is a strategy that adolescent pitchers use to produce ball velocity at the expense of putting more stress on the joints. To understand why excessive contralateral trunk tilt may be linked to increased joint loading, uh, I went back to the concept described by Feltner. And using the same concept, uh, we can see that the contralateral trunk tilt accelerates the shoulder upwards, causing the arm to lag down. The compensatory shoulder abduction torque produced by the deltoids accelerate the elbow upwards and cause the shoulder to externally rotate and elbow into valgus. Uh, when the trunk is tilting off to the side, uh, further lateral flexion in the trunk is assisted by the force of gravity, uh, which makes it easier for the trunk to tilt laterally rather than to axially rotate, axially rotate the trunk using the trunk musculature, uh, which may be why some pitchers adopt this strategy in the first place. Um, in 2015, Dr. Solomiro uh, published a study that also looked at the relationship between the contralateral trunk tilt and joint loading in collegiate pitchers. Uh, 
Um, in his study, he observed that for every 10 degrees increase in the contralateral tilt angle, uh, there was a relatively small increase in ball speed accompanied by a more significant increase in shoulder uh, rotation and elbow valgus torque. The study supports the observations from our study um, that I just described. Um, and in Dr. Solomiro's study, uh, the contralateral trunk tilt angle was calculated using the motion capture system, uh, which is not available to typical baseball pitchers. Um, so we compared the joint angles calculated based on the video recordings to the angles calculated using the motion capture system and found that the contralateral trunk uh, flexion angle at max arm cocking uh, could actually be measured with pretty good um, accuracy using video recording uh, from the front. This means that any coach or parent uh, with a smartphone could measure the angle um, at their fingertips. Um, um, another study uh, by Dr. Solomiro, uh, oops, excuse me, uh, looked at the sagittal plane trunk motion during pitching. Um, the study reported that the excessive forward tilt um, at ball release was associated with increased elbow valgus torque and ball velocity in collegiate pitchers. He also reported that beyond 28 degrees of trunk flexion, which was the group median, uh, for every 10 degrees increase in forward trunk tilt, uh, the ball velocity increased by 0.7 meters per second, uh, which is not a lot, uh, while the elbow valgus torque increased by almost three newton meters. Uh, this study and others demonstrates that the forward flexion of the trunk is necessary uh, to produce ball speed, but this study suggests that too much trunk flexion can increase the joint loading while getting only a small increase in ball speed. So there's uh, probably an optimal range there. Um, in the transverse plane, the early trunk rotation or uh, opening up the trunk too early in the pitching motion um, has been linked to uh, increased elbow valgus loading and injury risk. Um, two studies um, identify the uh, early trunk rotation in pitchers using standard video cameras. Uh, one study reported that the youth and high school pitchers uh, with an open shoulder and did not have their hand on top of the ball um, at the hand separation experienced higher elbow valgus loading compared to the pitchers with more proper um, technique. Um, the other study on major league baseball pitchers reported that um, early trunk rotation was associated with almost 1.7 times higher risk of throwing arm surgery compared to the pitchers who opened, um, opened their trunks a little bit later in the pitching motion. These two studies demonstrate that, again, a simple recording using the smartphone uh, may help identify the movement patterns that are potentially harmful to uh, the pitcher's arms. Um, using the uh, lab-based 3D uh, motion capture system, um, Dr. Aguinaldo, uh, who is also here uh, speaking after me today, um, also demonstrated that the uh, adult pitchers who started rotating their torso before the stride put contact experienced higher elbow valgus torque compared to the pitchers who waited until after the stride put contact to initiate the trunk rotation. Uh, while this movement pattern cannot be picked up easily by a recording of a video uh, like the other uh, variables that I talked today, uh, the emerging wearable and markerless technologies uh, may be used to assess them on the field uh, in the near future. Um, in 2014, uh, we published a paper that looked at the effects of the sequence of peak pelvis and trunk rotation velocity on the throwing arm biomechanics. Uh, the paper was motivated uh, by the concept that I read um, in the article by Putnam, uh, which described that in order for the momentum of the segment to be transferred from the proximal to the distal segment, uh, the distal segment must reach the peak velocity after the proximal segment reaches its peak velocity. I started looking at uh, my own data and realized that some pictures have a clear pattern of the two peaks, the lower peak representing the peak uh, pelvis rotation velocity and the taller, um, uh, taller peak representing the upper, uh, peak upper torso uh, rotation velocity. Um, while some pitchers uh, just didn't have that pattern. 
uh, when comparing the pitchers who demonstrated proper versus improper pelvis trunk rotation sequence, uh, we found that the pitchers who demonstrated the improper sequence experienced greater peak shoulder distraction force uh, and greater shoulder external rotation angle. The ball speed was not different uh, between the groups, uh, which suggests that the greater shoulder distraction force and the shoulder external rotation angles may be associated with the compensatory movement that pitchers adapted to make up for the momentum that was not transferred to the throwing arm through the trunk. In 2018, uh, Scarborough uh, published a paper that looked at the effects of the proper kinematic sequence of the pelvis, trunk, arm, form, and hand segments. Uh, in their study, they categorized the pictures based on where the sequence became out of order. Uh, DUE, uh, or distal upper extremity group, uh, included pictures who had the proper pelvis, trunk, arm sequence, uh, but the sequence became out of order after that. Uh, PUE, or proximal upper extremity group, included uh, pitchers who had the proper pelvis trunk sequence, but had out of order sequence at the arm. And the core group uh, included pitchers who had improper pelvis trunk uh, rotation sequence, uh, sort of like the uh, pitchers that I looked at in my own study. Um, while the average torques uh, for pitchers with the, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> um, uh, their study basically showed that uh, the pitchers with out of order sequence uh, experienced higher shoulder rotation and elbow valgus torque than the pitchers with the proper uh, rotation sequence. Um, while the uh, average torques for pitchers with the improper pelvis trunk sequence or the core group um, looks like it's not as high as the pitchers whose sequence broke down um, in the arm or the form. Uh, the authors uh, noted um, in the discussion that the subset of pitchers in the core group who also had an improper sequence in the arms uh, were among the pitchers with the highest joint loading of all. So in summary, uh, the trunk plays a vital role in baseball pitching um, and various trunk kinematic variables have been associated with higher joint loading. And some of the movement patterns like early trunk rotation and contralateral trunk tilt uh, can be identified without the motion capture system and wearable technology is becoming more and more available. So uh, these uh, kinematic variables uh, may be um, assessed uh, on the field uh, by a lot of the baseball pitchers, coaches, and parents. Um, and uh, however, uh, what we don't know is that um, uh, how to go about modifying uh, these specific trunk kinematics that may be associated with um, higher joint loading and injury risks. So that's continues to be the area of research uh, that we need to uh, work on. So thank you. I'll pass Thanks, it to uh, Arnel. Thank you. Over, over to you, Arnel. Thanks, Clan. Thanks, Saki. Um, hold on a sec. Cool. Bear with me, just gotta find my screen. I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Glenn Fleigsig for the invite as well as ISBS and the American Baseball Biomechanics Society. So uh, I've given this talk a few times in different form. Um, so I apologize for some of you who might have seen this before, but I update it uh, on occasion when we receive uh, new data. So. I'm gonna focus mainly on the pathomechanics of the elbow because uh, el pitching related elbow injuries remain uh, prevalent in all levels of baseball and how the energy flow through the kinetic chain as measured using segmental and induced power analysis uh, relates to the valgus loading at the elbow. And just give a quick update on the current research that we have going on at Point Loma as well as our colleagues at Wake Forest University. Uh, so this is our makeshift pitching lab uh, that we use on the campus of Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego, California. It is portable. It's a marking-based motion capture that we could take on the field. We are playing around with a number of different technologies, whether it's wearable sensors. Uh, we are a beta tester for a, a AI-based app looking at um, you know, just using an iPhone to measure these kinematics kinetics. And the early results so far are, are, are very promising. <clears throat> 
So in terms of uh, valgus loading, we know through years and years of research that the repetitive exposure to this extreme valgus torque at the elbow has been known to lead to uh, an increase in risk of various types of elbow injuries, whether we're talking about UCL, Tommy John, um, you know, osteochondritis, desiccans, and things like that. And if we focus just on the internal structures of the elbow, the resistance to that valgus torque is known as a various resistance resistance or a varus torque is facilitated by mainly the UCL, the ulnar collateral ligament, specifically the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, there are some studies that suggest that the musculature around the elbow also contribute to that varus resistance, as well as the articulation between the capitellum and the radial head. So all those combined have um, a certain amount of energy absorption, mechanical energy absorption that is that typically peaks at the end of the arm cocking phase as it transitions over to the acceleration phase. And so being able to measure and quantify that during the valgus load is obviously uh, highly relevant in terms of you know, identifying the pathomechanics of these elbow injuries because we know that the elbow is the weakest link in the kinetic chain. So I, I thought both uh, Gretchen and Saki did a great job of explaining the kinetic chain. So I'm gonna breeze through this real quick. But what I have here is the kinetic chain of baseball pitching as broken down into three main phases, the stride phase, arm cocking and acceleration phases. And I identify the key segments that are rotating throughout those phases. So you can see here the pelvis followed by the trunk, followed by shoulder external to internal rotation during arm acceleration and of course, elbow extension and flexion. And this is how it looks from um, just a rotational velocity perspective. Some of you who work with baseball players, uh, you've seen this before, we do this for both baseball pitchers as well as hitting. And we like to highlight that timing. So as uh, Saki did a great job explaining the summation of speed principle where a segment would initiate its angular velocity or its angular rotation when the segment proximal to it would reach its, its peak. And it, what I like to show here is obviously the pelvis and trunk because that's the core. And I've got these numbers here, which are the angular velocities that are the peak angular velocities for those various segments. And what we tell our pitchers is that don't get too hung up on these uh, values themselves. What we want to focus on is, is timing. And I, in 2019, I published a paper uh, that looked at segmental power, but we also gave this chart that talked about these timings in the peak angle velocities for the pelvis, trunk, elbow, and shoulder. And you can see here, this is a confidence interval for mainly adult minor league players. Um, when their specific segment reaches its peak angle velocity. And you can see that nice proximal to distal uh, flow. And then we compare, you know, whoever, whatever picture, whoever picture is coming into the lab and, just, and, with, and show them where they stack up in terms to, with respect to these norm reference standards. So in terms of the energy flow that's associated with that proximal to distal a sequence throughout the kinetic chain. We find that with pelvic rotation, there's a mechanical energy that's being generated. It transfers over to the trunk and then transfers over to the throwing arm in order to power, quote, quote, uh, power the acceleration of the shoulder. So here's a video, hopefully it comes up okay on your end. And what I did here in Visual 3D is simply color coded individual segments based on the segmental power of whether it's generating or absorbing. So if it's green, it's a technically absorbing power. And if it's red, it's generating. And we're gonna focus on the full body. So you can look here at the stride leg first. What we should see the stride leg as it goes into stride foot contact, it should be absorbing energy. And then pelvis is rotating, is finishing its rotation, followed by the trunk and followed by the throwing arm. So the technique that we use to estimate that energy transfer, energy generation of various segments is known as a segmental power analysis. It's certainly not a, a new technique. It is uh, an analysis that's been done for many years. In fact, it's been done for uh, baseball pitching in the past. So you can see here, there's, there's some data out of Japan where they estimated mechanical energy flows for the various segments of the body. Uh, this study right here on the right is a study out of Harvard, Roach and Lieberman. And what they found was that the shoulder gener during acceleration as expected generated a significant amount of power for the, the pitch itself. So I like showing these because there is certain precedent of using segmental power analysis to measure that 
that energy flow from segment to segment between adjacent segments. And the problem is, I think many of you know, if you're if you follow baseball and you, and you study baseball pitchers and softball pitchers, is that uh, pitching, baseball pitching and softball pitching is a classic open kinetic chain where the distal end is free to rotate. And that involves multi-articular body motion and it behaves much like a whip where the torques at the proximal, the larger proximal segments would tend to accelerate the other smaller segments of the kinetic chain. Again, Saki did a great job of showing how the centripetal acceleration contributes to the acceleration of the arm. So, you know, how we use the signals of power analysis in order to determine their, the effects of these energy flows on the proximal segment to the distal arm uh, varies, but it, for the most part, we use regression. So here's one study that I mentioned earlier. This is from 2019. And we found that trunk rotational power was a significant predictor of both valgus load at the elbow as well as uh, ball velocity. And Jacob Howenstein's and, and, and Christoph's group out of Marquette and St. Louis University, they found something similar. They found that both the uh, pelvic uh, segmental power transfer to the trunk as well as the uh, trunk to throwing arm transfer were significant predictors of ball velocity along with other energy flows throughout the, the kinetic chain. And not to be outdone, if we were just focus on the lower uh, you know, just a lower extremity on the stride and drive leg side. This is a study that uh, Dr. Kristen Nicholson and I and the group out of Wake Forest uh, presented uh, a couple years ago at ISBS and found that the stride foot braking force and the drive foot medial lateral force were significant predictors of elbow valgus load. Uh, McNally's group, something similar, where they found that the GRFs on the stride foot, the vertical and the braking force were a significant predictor of ball velocity. And what do these four studies have in common? Well, we found that the, the strength of relationship to either elbow valgus load, if we're talking about injury risk or pitching velocity, if we're talking about pitch performance, are significant predictors. They do contribute to the variance in these, uh, these two metrics of baseball pitching, but it's regression. It's all based on statistical analysis. And as many of you know, correlation does not equal causation. So we don't know, or it's unclear the mechanisms by which these lower half, the, the legs, the pelvis and trunk actually contribute to the acceleration of the throwing arm. So one technique that we've used, and this is a paper we published earlier last year, is uh, an extension of what's known as an induced acceleration analysis, which is uh, an induced power analysis. Again, it's an extension of an induced acceleration where a muscular torque would not only accelerate the uh, segment uh, that it's uh, directly attached, but it would also accelerate the other segments in the kinetic chain. So that's that centripetal, that Coriolis effect of that specific muscular torque. And it turns out that we could use a state space equation to quantify those effects. It's, a, it's known as a velocity dependent torque. You might've heard it as a motion dependent torque if you see some of the older papers. And again, that's just the, the interactive effects of a torque and the proximal ends. And this is the way that we can quantify that. And it's been used before. Um, uh, BJ Frigley and uh, Sajak published a paper in 1996 that looked at the contributions of, say, for example, uh, this power at the, 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 the femur and the tibia towards uh, total crank power. A uh, study out of Stanford looked at the contributions of ankle plantar flexor torques on the power of the center, acceleration and power of the, the center of mass during walking. And then during a soccer kick, the Naito found that the was used an induced power analysis or at least an iteration of it to determine the contributions of trunk rotations on the kicking leg during a soccer kick. So we then extended that or applied that IPA, induced power analysis, to the throwing arm. And so this is the same paper I just showed you here. Uh, this was a 10 degree of freedom system based on these three uh, modeled segments. And the 10 degrees of freedom refers to the three rotations at the trunk, three rotations at the shoulders, two at the elbow, and two at the wrist. And so by taking that induced power analysis equation, that state space equation, we can then decompose the components of an induced 
power or acceleration at the forearm. So in this case, we were interested in valgus loading, but you can use the same approach if you want to know the uh, contributions, the breakdown in the contributions, for example, for ball velocity. Uh, so once you are able to, or once we're able to uh, calculate the induced power for a specific segment, we can then integrate that power between the, uh, in the time intervals of front foot contact and maximum elbow valgus. Again, we were interested in valgus loading, and that gives us uh, the change in energy or otherwise known as mechanical work. So this is a, a representative pitch of the decomposed components of the induced uh, power at the, the forearm, again, we call it valgus loading here. And these are the components of the velocity torque, or what we found. And what you see here on the bottom, hopefully you guys can see this. I apologize for the small font here. The R1, R2, R3 denotes the three rotations of the trunk. R4 through R6 represents the shoulder, rotation of the shoulder, R7 and 8, the elbow, and 9 and 10 is uh, the wrist. And you could see that the main components of the velocity dependent torque is due to trunk motion. So something we already know, it reinforced the idea that trunks plays an important role and the way it does it is by, it manifests its acceleration, its torque on acceleration and subsequently the power at the forearm through this velocity dependent torque here. So um, again, what we're seeing here in this specific uh, study is the contributions of the core to the velo induced velocity, induced power of the forearm as the trunk rotates into the arm cocking phase. And then um, the shoulder goes into extreme amount of external rotation and that subsequently puts the elbow into that valgus load. That's where that power comes from, that energy absorption. And the key thing that I tell you, I mean, without actually looking at the, the data themselves, if you look at a picture, just look at any video and then pause it at, hopefully I can do this, at the MER, maximum external rotated position. This is the late arm, arm cocking phase. Look how much external rotation this picture has. That's close to 170, 175 degrees of external rotation. No picture can do that either actively or with a clinician, with a trainer passively, you know, um, you know, on a table or just sitting outside. You can only do that during the pitch itself. And that's because that, of that, that action, that the velocity dependent effects of pelvis and trunk motion at, through the late arm cocking phase as it transitions over to the acceleration phase. Uh, these are the breakdowns of the mechanical work for the, those individual decomposed components. You could see here that the velocity dependent torque is negative. That represents energy absorption at the forearm in the late arm cocking phase. And the decomposed components of that is represented by the trunk, more specifically trunk flexion and trunk rotation. So those in this case represented the largest contributions to the induced power of the, um, of the forearm here. So um, the, the IPA, the induced power analysis, uh, decomposed the components of both the muscular and velocity dependent torques and found that the flexion and rotation all contribute to the, the energy absorbed at the elbow slash forearm in the late arm cocking phase. And so it reinforces the, the idea or the suggestion that the core represents the power that contributes in this case to elbow valgus loading. Now, some key takeaways from this initial analysis is that we were limited by the simple model. So we did not model the internal structures of the elbow, whether it's the UCL, the osseous contribution, the muscular contribution. So we, we believe there's energy absorption, but that wasn't quantified in this specific study. Now, if we look at the study uh, of Harvard, Roach and Lieber, and as well as Jimmy Buffy's article, uh, they, but Jimmy Buffy's article or study actually used OpenSim and broke down the contributions of torque, various torque for these individual structures. Um, what we hope to, to provide is to extend the IPA over to these individual structures and determine is there actual energy storage here, which is what Roach and Lieberman propose is that during that late arm cocking phase that those structures are now storing that energy, elastic energy that is ultimately released during the arms acceleration phase. And I talk about the elbow, but also the, the shoulders going into this extreme amount of external rotation, 
In fact, there was a st recent study, uh, Gretchen Oliver can uh, comment about this, uh, just recently published on the, what they found was those pictures who showed uh, increased glenohumeral stability. This is glenohumeral stability as measured using the closed kinetic upper extremity stability tests. Those who had the stable glenohumeral joints also tend to have greater energy transfer from the trunk to the throwing arm. And so if we look at MER, look at the leg arm cocking phase, all of that energy storage we believe is being released towards ball release. And this, the, the, the numbers are the data that's coming out of Roach and Lieberman. This is an earlier paper. What they found was those players or throwers, this is mainly throwers, flat ground throwers, who have a, a increased humoral retroversion actually showed greater work or mechanical energy absorbed at the energy that ultimately released in acceleration and their ball speeds were higher. So this is you know, at least some initial data that reinforces the idea that by cocking back that arm, you, you know, stretch that rubber band and then release it in order to accelerate the arm forward during, during a, a ball release. Uh, again, Saki made a great point about this is, there was a paper out of Curl and Joe many years ago where they did EMG and showed that both the triceps and some of the rotator cuff muscles were actually silent during, I wouldn't say silent, but not very active during the arm acceleration. So that's all that motion dependent effects, that centripetal and coilless effects that the, the whip action of the, of the pitch itself. Now, this specific IPA model was again was limited with just those three segments of the upper body so it's really difficult to have any um, uh, you know limited in terms of its meaningfulness and its application because we're ignoring the lower half and the reason why we lower we ignore the lower half is the data that we have we did not have ground reaction force data in order to sufficiently model the lower the kinetics of the lower uh, extremities we simply didn't have force plates so we teamed up with uh, Wake Forest University. Um, I believe uh, Kristen is on, online with us. And this is an old picture of their lab. And what they show here is a pro mound that's embedded with three AMTI force platforms, one by the rubber and then two down the mound itself. So by getting a full body kinematic and kinetic um, uh, picture, of what the player is doing, we can then subsequently extend that into an induced acceleration and induced power analysis. So this is one example here taken from their lab. It could see ground reaction force on both the drive side and stride side and the, um, the co corresponding power, this is actually induced power of the various segments throughout the, the baseball pitch. So we broke it down, this is just, um, First, the ex induced acceleration, we were interested in induced velocity. How can we do a full body induced acceleration analysis in order to decompose the contributions of all the major segments in the kinetic chain towards ball velocity? One is shoulder torque, which as expected, right? That's the, you know, uh, the internal um, um, muscular torque at the shoulder. And as also expected, the velocity dependent torque. Notice here, I'm gonna go back right here the, to the first part where the contributions of the lower extremity, the waist, which is pelvis and trunk and the elbow is very minimal towards the induced ball velocity of the ball. And you're looking, why? That's confusing. How is that possible that none of those have a direct contributions to, to the induced ball itself? Well, what did I mention earlier? Their contributions manifested by that velocity dependent torque. And as I showed you earlier, we broke down those components of the velocity dependent torque that's mainly due to pelvic and uh, trunk rotation. Uh, now breaking it down, we could uh, then extend that over to the percentage of contribution toward a total induced velocity. Again, here, lower extremity is very minimal. Again, direct contributions, waist um, is minimal, but the shoulder and the velocity dependent components here represents the largest contribution to the induced velocity. So let's show that video again. And I wanna highlight, cause I get questions uh, a lot regarding the stride and drive legs and how they don't have a, specifically don't have a direct contribution to the induced velocity of the, the pitch itself. So what you oh, should Arnell, you Arnell, are we getting, are, are we getting near the I'm end running? here? Very end, sorry, Glenn. Uh, so I just want to summarize here that the contributions of the legs during the uh, late, 
in, during the, uh, the pitch itself is by stabilizing and finishing up pelvic rotation. And subsequently that energy would flow from the pelvis to the trunk to the throwing arm. And again, through the, uh, the actions of both the trunk and pelvis is manifested through this velocity dependent torque in order to accelerate the arm forward. Thank you. My dance now, and I'm gonna turn up, we're gonna to go to the second session. This leads into that, which is really about some training exercises uh, and, and related to pitching. Um, I guess, uh, Arnell, you're first up. Yeah, yeah, let me uh, go ahead and get my slide up. So I, I, as I apologize for, for going a little over time, my last talk, so I promised to make up the time in this specific talk. Um, so I'm going to focus um, mainly on weighted ball training, plyometric training, either underloaded or overloaded training in effects on baseball pitching biomechanics. And the way that we did this series of analysis is kind of twofold. One is using what's known as a critically appraised topic. So those of you are not familiar with CAD that appraises the best evidence in the current scientific literature regarding weight ball training on elbow injury risk, on elbow injury risk. And then I'll describe a study that we did last year with one of my uh, grads that are looking at the pitch velocities and male elbow valgus are between pitchers who normally train with weighted ball training and those who do not, like kind of the standard training. So uh, if you're familiar with weighted ball throwing, it's uh, that implement or weighted implement and plyometric method throwing has been around uh, for years, since the 60s, it's been studied and it's primarily used to increase throwing velocity. And we know that it actually works. There's evidence in the literature that you know, shows that the uh, speed actually increases with the uh, weighted ball or weighted implement training. Uh, the, in Caldwell's systematic review, he found that in seven of the 10 studies that he included in the review sh um, showed or reported increases in ball velocity after weighted ball training. The problem is, is the inconsistency. If you look at the ball weights, they all range from, you know, uh, two ounces to five pounds and a duration of training ranges from four to 12 weeks. And so the change in velocity subsequently um, ranges from two to 11 miles per hour, the change in the, the velocity does. So, uh, you know, even though there's variability, we know that it does work. It does work in the sense that ball velocity seems to increase after training with these weighted implements. And the underlying theory it involves that underloaded training tends to increase speed and overloaded training tends to increase arm strength along with uh, speed. However, pitching related elbow injuries remain prevalent as we uh, discussed in the, the last um, uh, session. So there's really a, a lack of data in the current literature that you know, addresses the potential injury risks of weighted ball programs. In other words, is it safe to implement these programs to increase ball velocity in terms of minimizing the risk of injury? So in, in this cat, we sought out to answer this focused clinical question is that, is there evidence to suggest that throwing related elbow injury risk increases with weighted ball training than without weighted ball training in baseball pitchers. And I've had here a couple of pictures that um, from institutions or organizations that use weighted ball trainings on a regular basis. Uh, did a, a search strategy based on terms on this PICO, baseball pitchers, weighted ball training, unloaded training. Um, the key outcome measures are those biomechanical uh, parameters that operationally define, in this case, elbow injury. So, elbow valgus torque and shoulder external rotation. We included studies that examined the effects of underweight and or overweight implement training, uh, baseball pitching, uh, that actually measured elbow valgus or varus if you go by the internal moment uh, convention and shoulder uh, external rotation, at least those two. Uh, studies that compared pre and post intervention and at least level two evidence or higher and published in the last 10 years. We excluded uh, any uh, secondary sources like narratives and systematic reviews and cross-sectional studies, which is ironic because I'm gonna be presenting a cross-sectional study here in a few minutes. Uh, so we, uh, we perused EBSCO, PubMed, and Google Scholar came up with 46 studies that were retrieved and screened. And then of those 46, 39 of them were uh, excluded uh, by title and abstract. And the remaining seven studies were assessed by that inclusion exclusion criteria I just defined which uh, brought me or brought us to these four 
a particular study. So the four studies that is included in, in this cat was the RINAL study, which is really the only randomized control trial that specifically looked at weighted ball uh, throwing programs on injury risk. A study out of driveline, uh, which was a, a cohort study. I'll go over all of these in, in detail in a sec here. Uh, Okoroha study out of Henry Ford in Detroit uh, involving youth pitchers on the impact of ball weight on valgus torque. And of course, uh, Glenn's study a few years ago in 2017. I actually have two of Glenn's study and I promise he didn't hit me up and um, bribe me with coffee or anything like that to include him in this cat. Okay, so taking the first study, this is a uh, uh, Mike Reinhold's study with ASMI. This is, as I mentioned, the only randomized control trial that uh, measured these biomechanical outcome measures on as, and, and had a control group that did no training with um, either underloaded or overloaded implements. The training group did the uh, six week weighted ball that ranged from two to 32 ounces in terms of weighted implement from the knee rocker and running gun positions. I actually have some pictures of those. They measured things like pitch velocity, arm speed, various torque, uh, passive range of motion of both the shoulder and elbow. And the interesting results from here is that there were no between group differences in pitch velocity, although the training group did gain about 3% of um, uh, miles per hour in their actual velocity. No differences in elbow varus torque or arm speed, but the shoulder external rotation range of motion increased by 4.7 degrees in the training group. Interesting finding also was that the, the injury rate in the training group went up 24%. And I believe this was like during the study period or shortly thereafter in the season. Uh, Pedro, if you're familiar with the Pedro scale, this is a checklist by the physiotherapist evidence-based uh, 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 evidence database, which allows us to rate the quality of evidence in intervention studies. And this one, uh, this particular study got seven out of 10. Most biomechanical studies tend to get lower than eight because you can't, it's almost impossible to blind either the researchers or the, um, the um, participants themselves. So uh, in, in terms of does it increase the risk of injury? In this case, yes, if you base it on shoulder external rotation, as well as the increase in the injury incident, 24%. Uh, so as I mentioned, shoulder external rotation has been shown to be a uh, significant predictor of elbow valgus or elbow injuries in general. And we show that there was an increase of 4.7 degrees in shoulder external rotation. It was, it's, it's somewhat of a dichotomy because the, the Increase in shoulder external rotation also allows, as I mentioned in my previous talk, that extra storage, right? That more capacity in order to be released during acceleration and therefore increase ball velocity, but it also increases the risk of elbow injury, as is shown here. So, you know, you give and take here. Uh, photos of the knee throwing from the knee position, uh, the rocker position, and the run and gun is how these weighted implements are, are used. Next study, this is a prospective cohort uh, out of driveline. This is an interesting study because they utilize uh, full body uh, kinematics based on market-based motion capture. Uh, the, uh, the college and pro pitchers, a sample of 17, all uh, underwent a six week training program with ply balls that range from three and a half to five pounds with warm up recovery periods. Uh, there's no control group to which uh, these kinematics and kinetics were compared. But what's interesting is that they found no increase in shoulder external rotation or elbow varus torque. And so in this particular case, there was, um, it did not answer, it was inconclusive in my opinion, in terms of the, does this particular um, weighted ball intervention increase the risk of elbow. Uh, these are some pictures from their, their website. Um, I, I wanna show this one because our baseball team at Point Loma does use the driveline uh, pliable um, program uh, for all our pitchers. Um, so this is the study that was published and they're, they're, I'm sorry, the kinetic uh, variables that were um, uh, analyzed in their study and found that there's no significant difference among almost all of them except for shoulder A deduction, but for various torque and external rotation, there was no significant difference between pre and post. Again, there was no control group in here. Uh, so it had a lower uh, Pedro score. Uh, this study was a more of a crossover study. So the uh, pictures that were included in the sample served as their own uh, control, if you will. 
Uh, they all threw five ma uh, max effort fastballs of four weighted ball conditions from three to six ounces in randomized order. And they did show that various torque increase with increasing ball weight and ball speed decrease with increasing ball weight. So this is just a couple of their uh, charts that are presented. You could see here the decrease in ball velocity with increased ball weight and increase in um, torque at the elbow with increased ball weight. And I should note that they use the modus sleeve to um, measure valgus torque or bearish torque, depending on your, your convention. Their study, the results of their study actually disagreed with what Glenn found in 2017, which was the other way around. Um, they used full body kinematics, uh, crossover RCT, and found that elbow bearish torque actually decreased with increased ball weight increased elbow flexion torque was the only thing that actually increased. Um, and we found that what they did is they come, uh, had mound as well as flat ground throwing with these implements that range from four to seven ounces and the flat ground holds, which is basically flat ground throwing without a release was uh, included the 14 and 32 ounces. Uh, so just to kind of give you, I'd like to show this graph and probably Glenn could explain this better than I can because here for both flat ground and for mound here, you could see the decrease in the various torque with increasing ball mass. And what they reported, what they believe happened was that yes, there is an increase in mass is therefore you would expect an increase of that weight and force that uh, on the, the uh, distal end of the arm. But we, they believe that the, these exercises would, uh, would tend to lower the acceleration that's involved at the arm and therefore subsequently the, the torque decrease with the increased ball mass there. So the clinical bottom line based on CAT is that it, we're still inconclusive. There's just simply not enough evidence in the current literature to support one way or the other, whether it's safe to implement this weight, weighted ball uh, throwing program without increasing the risk of injury. And so the strength of recommendation here, uh, based on what we found here is a C. So with, with that note, uh, we did a pilot a couple of years ago, uh, at least one of my grad students presented this st particular study at last year's ACSM to compare uh, pitch velocity and elbow valgus torque using a uh, modus sleeve between collegiate baseball players who normally train with weighted balls versus those who do not. Uh, as I mentioned, we use uh, our, our Point Loma uh, pitching staff that uses drive lines, uh, apply a ball um, program. And we also recruited nine collegiate players from a local JC. And we compare the two, it's just a cross-sectional study, one-time study. Uh, compared to elbow valgus as well as ball speed between the two groups. And we found, which is interesting, is that height, mass, and ball speed were not statistically significant. However, elbow valgus torque was. And you could see here for the weighted ball group, this is a group that normally uses weighted ball training, had a, more than twice as um, much of an elbow valgus torque as those who use a standard training. It's statistically significant. We double checked the numbers. They threw 15 fastballs and they were very um, uh, consistent. You can see the coefficient variation in elbow valgus torque measurements were 6%. Um, so, it, you know, it's uh, one of those things, at least based on this pilot data that, you know, that raises some red flags that perhaps uh, it's not safe. Limitations obviously is cross-sectional design. There's only a one-time, um, you know, a, a study that we made and compared between the two. Uh, we definitely need more randomized control trials that specifically looked at this intervention and other interventions that are out there. I think we can borrow the, a paradigm from ACL research, especially with the advent of wearable sensors and markless technology that allows us to measure the biomechanics of these pictures in their natural setting more, more easily, and then begin to tease out what are the effects of these training strategies over time on these metrics that I showed you here. So, thank you. How are we doing on time, Glenn? Okay, well, we're gonna go right, that was good. We're gonna go right to Saki now. <laughs> okay. Try to uh, here. keep yeah, moving along. Oh, uh, jump right in then. <laughs> All right, yeah, so my right. second talk um, is about the effects of training proximal segments on baseball pitching ball mechanics. <clears throat> Um, as we discussed in the first presentation, uh, the trunk serves as a proximal link uh, to the throwing arm and how we move our trunk strongly influence uh, the way the throwing arm moves. 
Um, the trunk consists of the upper torso or the thoracic spine and the rib cage that is attached to it in the lower core region. Um, and this core region is a three-dimensional structure uh, that is composed of four muscular borders. The anterior lateral border being the rectus abdominis, internal and external oblique, uh, and the transverse abdominis. Posterior border being the hip flexors, quadratus lumborum, and multifidus. Um, superior border is the diaphragm, and the uh, inferior border is the uh, pelvic floor muscles. Um, the core muscles uh, functions to stabilize the spine and trunk through the coordinated action of, uh, <coughs> of the muscles that maintain the pressure uh, within this abdominal cavity. Um, and the core muscles are also active during dynamic activities such as pitching um, in stabilizing the lumbopelvic region of the trunk uh, to allow the momentum uh, from the lower extremity to be transferred to the upper torso and then to the upper extremities. And some of these uh, core muscles um, also actively control the upper torso movement through its attachment to the rib cage as well. Um, the study that looked at the EMG activity of the abdominal muscles during a throwing motion uh, described that prior to the foot contact, uh, the right-handed pitcher's left oblique uh, is active in order to keep the upper torso from rotating together with the pelvis and maintaining that closed shoulder position. And after the pitching, um, um, after the uh, stride foot contact, excuse me, um, the external oblique of the right and the left um, right side and internal obliques on both sides, uh, both become active to rotate the upper torso towards the hitter and to eccentrically control the contralateral trunk tilt motion. Um, because of these roles that the abdominal muscles play in the pitching motion, uh, I became interested in studying the relationship between trunk muscle function and trunk kinematics during baseball pitching. So in my first presentation, I talked about how pitching with excessive control trunk tilt uh, may be a strategy that uh, the adolescent pitchers, uh, young pitchers, uh, use to produce ball speed at the expense of putting more stress on the arm. Um, I also talked about how the strategy may be a preference for the pitchers to rely on the force of gravity to let the trunk fall off to the side, rather than using the forces uh, produced by the abdominal muscles to actually rotate uh, the trunk to move the throwing arm forward. Uh, for this reason, um, I conducted a study to examine the relationship between the contralateral trunk tilt angle and the abdominal strength in youth baseball pitchers. And I classified the pitchers into low, moderate, and high contralateral trunk flexion group uh, based on the 2D uh, contralateral trunk tilt angle. And pitchers, um, <coughs> uh, pitchers were placed into the low uh, tilt group um, if the angle was lower than 15 degrees, uh, moderate group if the angle was between 15 and 30, and high group if the angle was more than 30 degrees. Um, I then uh, compared the trunk extension, flexion, and rotation strength uh, using the contraptions shown in the pictures um, on this slide. So what I found uh, was that the pictures in the high contralateral angle group uh, demonstrated higher ball velocity compared to the pictures in the low and the moderate angle groups. And this finding is consistent uh, with the findings from the previous studies um, that linked greater contralateral trunk tilt to higher ball speed. Uh, when looking at the results of the trunk strength, uh, the trunk rotation strength in the direction that the trunk would rotate during the arm cocking and acceleration phase of the pitching motion uh, was actually not different uh, between the groups. Um, however, there was a trend that the pitchers in the high contralateral tilt group having a lower trunk rotation strength in the direction that the trunk would rotate before the stride foot contact to keep the shoulders from opening up too early. Uh, we also looked at the ratio of the strength uh, to each side and saw that the trunk rotation strength um, as the trunk rotated towards the throwing shoulder uh, was about 80% of the strength uh, rotating away from the throwing shoulder in high tilt group pitchers. Um, in low contralateral tilt group pitchers, the trunk rotation strength uh, rotating towards the throwing arm was about 110% of the strength rotating away from the throwing arm. Uh, this indicates that the uh, high contralateral tilt pitchers uh, demonstrates a greater asymmetry in the trunk rotation strength. 
Um, in our study that looked at the effects of contralateral trunk tilt on biomechanics uh, of pitching, uh, we noted that all pitchers who demonstrated the excessive contralateral tilt uh, were leaned backwards during the stride. Um, this is in contrast to only 21% of the pitchers who weren't leaned back demonstrating the excessive tilt. Um, so when you're leaning back um, during the stride, you're pretty much destined uh, to lean off to the side um, as you rotate your torso. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, uh, when the pitcher uh, who is leaned backwards during the stride rotates to face the hitter, uh, the pitcher's torso will be laterally tilted uh, because of the tilt in the longitudinal axis of the torso. Uh, it is possible that the poor trunk control uh, during the stride phase in the pitchers in the high tilt group may have resulted in poor positioning of the trunk during the stride, which led them to having the uh, greater contralateral tilt angle. I found another study that examined the relationship between trunk muscle function and contralateral trunk tilt angle during pitching. Um, in this study, the researchers uh, examined if the trunk muscle endurance um, assessed using the trunk flexion and extension fatigue test and the side plank test, along with the uh, trunk flexibility and stance foot balance uh, would be correlated uh, with the contralateral tilt angle in collegiate pitchers. Uh, they found that the trunk endurance was not correlated with the contralateral trunk tilt angle. Um, the lack of significant correlation uh, may be because the study looked at uh, collegiate pitchers who are more developed um, and skilled at pitching, um, or because they didn't look at the rotational trunk motion um, or the uh, strength uh, of those muscles. Uh, instead, they looked at the endurance components. Um, interestingly, a study by Plummer uh, and colleagues uh, examined the relationship between the trunk lean during pitching and the trunk lean during the single leg squat in youth baseball pitchers and found that uh, two were correlated with each other. Uh, the pitchers who leaned more during pitching uh, also leaned more during the single leg squat. Uh, the authors discussed that the trunk lean during the single leg squat has been linked to weak hip muscles and therefore uh, the weakness of the hip muscles and the stabilization of the pelvis uh, may be underlining the pel uh, trunk tilt uh, during baseball pitching in youth pitchers as well. Um, in addition to these studies, um, poor uh, lumbopelvic control during the single leg stance test um, has been correlated with uh, missing uh, more days uh, because of an injury in major league pitchers and poor lumbopelvic control while standing on the drive leg um, has been correlated with increased shoulder and elbow uh, torques in collegiate and minor league pitchers. Um, also decreased performance in the Y balance test that requires control of the trunk motion um, has been uh, reported in pitchers with UCL tears. Uh, these studies are all evidence to support the importance of um, pitching um, of pitchers having a good core muscle function. And all the studies that uh, we discussed today uh, basically uh, provides a compelling argument that training the core muscles uh, would improve the pitching performance and lower the joint kinetics. So I went to PubMed to search for the literature that examined the effects of training that specifically targets the core segments on baseball pitching mechanics. Surprisingly, um, I was only able to find eight studies uh, with a control or a comparison group, and only two of them uh, were on baseball or softball players. Uh, the rest of them were on team handball players, which doesn't make it any less important, but since this is a uh, baseball softball session, uh, I'm just gonna look at two of these studies. Uh, one of the two studies, I used a sling uh, training system uh, to train collegiate softball players over 12 weeks. Uh, they had two experimental groups and both groups went through the same uh, Olympic lifts, lower body training and some core exercises, uh, but the closed kinetic chain group performed the upper, extra, upper body exercises using the sling system. Um, in contrast, the open kinetic chain group uh, performed the same exercises uh, using free weights and dumbbells. So the upper body exercise uh, using the sling system requires the athlete to use the core muscles um, to stabilize the trunk uh, while performing the exercises. 
Um, at the end of the 12 week training, the players in the closed kinetic chain group or the sling training group um, had improved ball speed, um, but the players in the open kinetic chain group didn't, uh, which shows that the addition of core stabilization components to the training program had some effects on their throwing performance. Um, the second study compared the effects of the core training programs that were focused on endurance and stability versus the program that focused more on strength and power in collegiate uh, baseball and softball players. Uh, the endurance stability group uh, did so-called um, traditional um, core or spinal stabilization exercises um, that emphasized the role of the core muscles in stabilizing the trunk. Uh, on the other hand, the strength power group performed more dynamic exercises that involved the use of sports-specific uh, weight-bearing rotational movements, um, high resistance, and explosive movements. Um, after seven weeks, uh, both groups demonstrated an increase in trunk muscle function and ball velocity. However, the improvement was greater in the strength power group. Um, and this study shows the benefit of incorporating sports specificity in the core training program. Um, this makes sense in that the core muscles uh, don't just stabilize the trunk during the pitching motion. Uh, they are also actively engaged to dynamically control the trunk motion. Um, neither studies, um, however, examine the effects of the training program on pitching kinematics or kinetics. Uh, this indicates that we still don't have a clear understanding of if and how the core training program affects the pitching mechanics or whether the increase in ball velocity from the core training is accompanied uh, by the change in pitching kinematics. <clears throat> so in summary, um, stability and dynamic movements of the trunk uh, plays an important role in transferring the momentum uh, from the lower to the upper extremity. Uh, there are some studies that link the function of the lumbopelvic muscles and pitching biomechanics and injury. And there are many studies that combined make a good argument uh, that the training the core uh, would help the pitching biomechanics. Um, however, more research that examines how improving the core and hip musculature uh, affects the pitching kinematics and performance is warranted. So, on to you, Arnold. Thanks, Saki. All right, Gretchen, take us home. Oh, that's right. Gretchen. Oh, sorry, sorry. She has one more slide? No, 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 no. I, I said uh, off to you, Arnell, but it was Gretchen next. So. Yeah. Uh, you're mute. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Are we good? Yeah, we see your okay. we see your slide. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, but you have to hit the slide show. We don't. We only see the. Oh, gotcha. I thought I was muted. Okay. Here we go. We're good. Yeah. Um. Mine pretty much, I'm going to discuss hip range for motion and strength in softball pitchers. And I would say that it really is a follow-up summary uh, from the great presentations Arnell and Saki did. And um, even going in, if we go back to Arnell's first one on uh, the importance of the trunk and positioning. So the first part of it, we can jump a little ahead because we've been talking about this, but I do want to uh, reiterate the fact that when we work in a uh, proximal to distal manner, for the most part, uh, we can generate a great study by Kibler uh, done back in the late 90s, who was looking at tennis athletes and it showed that they could, much of the a serve generation, that energy for the serve generation was coming anywhere from 50, 55% uh, percent of that total energy was from the lower extremity thus uh, reiterating the importance of the core or the lumbopelvic hip complex. Often I'll refer to it as the lumbopelvic hip complex versus the core. And that's uh, mainly to remind me that yes, we've got to focus on the hips, not just the trunk. And uh, that's where we get into when we talk about hip range of motion and strength. And when I talk about the hip range of motion and strength, I really, it takes me to, okay, um, that's lumbopelvic hip stability and mobility. So um, that goes back to all the studies that Saki just mentioned. But so for softball, 
if we um, know the importance of the hips, because anecdotally, softball pitchers, they're either going to complain about their shoulder or they all tend to have a hip tightness, not necessarily injuries, but they have, um, they usually complain of hip tightness after repeated bouts of throwing. And so my point was, okay, if we have a decrease in range of motion, then we're going to alter that important drive out, the important part of the pitch. And then eventually we're going to uh, lose the energy that we're generating from the lower half to be able to be transferred up the kinetic chain uh, through the trunk and on out to the upper extremity for ball release. So uh, going back and looking at the baseball studies, just particularly looking at hip range of motion, there's tons of studies out there looking at uh, shoulder range of motion, but when we look at hip range of motion, um, we found like the Laudner study in 15, they looked at collegiate baseball players and they uh, measured passive hip rotational range of motion. And for this, I'm just focusing on rotational range of motion of the hips. And those with decreased uh, rotational hip range of motion were associated with greater shoulder kinetics during uh, pitching. Now, it should be noted if you were to go back and uh, look at some of these studies that some of them may be a little different in their findings and um, you'll notice the methodologies. So some have them um, lying to measure hip range of motion, other ones have them seated to measure hip range of motion. So that is uh, something in the literature that uh, when they have conflicting findings, that tends to be the methodological approach to the measurement. Uh, Rob and them also looked at um, hip range of motion and uh, they found altered trunk and pelvis kinematics. And um, we back in uh, 14 looked at hip range of motion in youth and found that those that had decreased, um, I guess it would be stride leg external rotation strength and range of motion also had altered scapular kinematics when throwing. And then uh, there's studies that look at over the course of a season. So in the, this, they measured hip range of motion for preseason and postseason and found significant decreases, as well as looking at hip range of motion, the Harding study over uh, cumulative pitches. So cumulative during the week, cumulative throws and found a decrease. With these, the important thing here to note is the decrease in hip range of motion that we're seeing is, has been related with altered trunk and upper extremity kinematics, but now it's also, we have several studies that find that the altered hip range of motion is associated with either um, upper extremity pain or upper extremity injury. So with that all going together and we add in the position of the trunk and the importance of the trunk, that's where, uh, Phil, we really need to focus on this hip range of motion. And to show you a video real quick for the pitching, I'm gonna call their stride leg. So here we're gonna have, it's the leg striding out, it's gonna be their stride leg. And just like in baseball, we have to have the optimal foot position. And then um, with this also, the drive leg can push us out. So we had to have the optimal foot position at foot contact. And, but also we have to be able to push ourselves out there. And just like back in, um, some people will uh, say, okay, are you driving down the mound or you, how are you coming down the mound? The same thing here with softball pitching is um, in youth, we tend to see that they drive out, but then they get stuck. Ideally for our great pitchers, once they have foot contact, we want them to use that um, lead leg, that stride leg to then pull them through the pitch and from ball release onto um, follow through. So basically st stride hip, we need to have adequate external rotation for that proper foot um, position. Stance hip, we're gonna have internal rotation as the trunk rotates around and then we had to have adequate external rotation. So when we're looking at this, um, like I said, there's ample in baseball literature, but there's not that much in the softball literature. So from a clinical perspective, we know that ideally if I'm measuring passive hip range of motion, I need 45 degrees uh, internal rotation, 45 degrees external rotation. And so 
these are the few studies that could maybe start to develop some normative data on looking at hip range of motion in softball pitchers. And then there's even fewer that have looked at isometric strength. So as you see that the stride hip tends to have, um, we, we tend to have greater external rotation, both stride and drive, and we tend to have decreased internal rotation. All of these studies though, they were on a small group of individuals. So again, we really, we don't know what we need. We haven't taken the next step to really look at it um, through greater populations, looking at professionals and uh, injury risk, et cetera. But there are uh, three studies that I want to highlight in this. And uh, first one is we looked at functional differences in softball pitchers with and without upper extremity pain. So functional differences, I'm just focusing now on the um, hip range of motion and hip strength. And what we found was that uh, we had 53, and these were collegiate pitchers, division one collegiate pitchers, and um, 30 were pain-free, 20 had upper, 23 had upper extremity pain. And we examined hip rotational range of motion through uh, just um, electrogoniometer and isometric strength through a uh, dynamometer. And though the group that had upper extremity pain, we saw a decrease in hip range of motion as well as a decrease in isometric strength in our drive uh, hip. So in our uh, throwing side hip, the one that's on the rubber that we're pushing out, we had a decreased strength. And then we also had decreased isometric strength in the stride. So the isometric strength for pain we found decreases in both hips. With range of motion, it was only in the drive hip. For our next one here, this is one, and it um, it goes through kind of uh, like Saki did, looking at a, an intervention. It was not a controlled uh, trial, and there were only four uh, collegiate softball pitchers in this. However, the point of it was to say, okay, if we implement some of those um, core exercises, some of those lumbopelvic exercises, can we maintain hip mobility and can we maintain hip strength throughout the course of a season? And uh, the exercises that we did, we focused on um, here, and I'll go back to what we found. A lot of the exercises were basic, um, anything that was gonna help stabilize the pelvis. So I focused a lot on the glutes, particularly the glute med. And we would perform these exercises 15 minutes before their game warm up, and um, they we performed them for 15 minutes, and it was uh, basically 15 minutes before they started their typical game warm up. And we chose about five to eight exercises and rotated those around. So what we found is throughout the course of a season, by doing this, we implemented zero stretching, a lot of just looking at the pelvic stability, those muscles we found no significant decreases in hip range of motion over the course of a season. We also um, found a significant increase in our isometric strength of our drive hip, particularly in external rotation. All of them did increase in strength, but it wasn't significant. And you question this, uh, the stats here because there were four. The point is from the four, we did not have any type of range of motion issues at the end of the season. And with that also being said, there was no time loss injuries throughout the season. Uh, we also measured uh, workload throughout. We, di we didn't do any of that in this uh, little pilot study. But uh, so before and after each game, we would measure the range of motion on those game days. And like I said, it, from the pre to the post, from the first of the season to the last of the season, we saw that, okay, we didn't have decreases in the range of motion and we didn't have time loss injuries. And um, then this third study here, it uh, will be out in Journal of Athletic Training. And this is to start doing some energy flow investigations with softball. And so what we wanted to do is see if we looked at, and these were youth, if we said, okay, let's look at hip range of motion and strength, same thing, internal, external range of motion, and see what it, how it uh, relates to energy flow uh, through the trunk and the upper extremity. And what we found was that um, those with increased drive hip, um, external rotational strength, 
So to push off, they had uh, they were associated with the increased net energy outflow from the distal trunk and humerus onto the forearm. And that's in the acceleration phase. So um, it kind of tags on with what we've been seeing in the trunk, but now we're like, huh, okay, we, we are seeing some stuff with range of motion. Um, we had about 30 some participants in this study, I believe. So, and then we also saw higher rates of distal outflow were associated with greater pitch speed. So again, this build, builds on Arnell's um, review of energy flow in baseball and reiterating the fact that, okay, a lot of the premise that, that we're focusing on about the pelvis, the trunk, and how we're gonna go about training those uh, are quite similar between the two sports. So in summary here, uh, the proximal histories, this is what, when we go back to Putman's papers and we go back and look at the kinetic chain, and uh, if we remember back, it's yes, those proximal histories, the histories of the uh, lower extremity segments, they do determine the success of our distal segments, especially when we're trying to um, implement the hardest throw and for it to be accurate. We also know that hip range of motion is associated with pain and injury. It's associated with altered trunk and pelvis kinematics, also um, altered upper extremity kinetics. And um, it, it, there is a relationship with our energy flow, uh, our outflow of the trunk and the humerus. So overall, and then we had the pitching and looking at the, uh, glute activation. So I think it really, I think this is a great summary from the three papers, uh, reiterating the importance of lumbopelvic control, trunk, uh, trunk energy, and trunk kinematics. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, 